So this morning we continue our journey through the series called Sleeping Giant, thinking about how we as church are actually a giant, but too often we're sleeping, too often we're going through the motions, too often we've got too comfortable and we're just, we're just getting by sometimes, eh? We're just getting by and just not really thinking about some of the higher things. There's a story of a, a, a chap who was shipwrecked. He was shipwrecked on a desert island, as, as you know they often are. And when a ship finally rescued him, he decided to give them a wee tour of the island before, before they took him away back to civilization. And he showed them the first hut, and he said, this is, this is my home, this is where I stay, this is where I've survived all these months and years. And then he took him to this next building and said, this is my church. This is where I worship every Sunday and I give thanks to God. And then there was another hut, and the captain of the ship said, well, what's that hut there? He said, oh, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> it takes a wee while, that one. I can see you're not quite up onto it. How often is it you get to the point where you think, actually, I've got to change. I've got, I've got to move on. And actually, the truth of the matter is we've got to dig deeper, and we've got to invite God in. And sometimes He calls us to… He calls us actually to be committed and to be one with Him even when we don't seem to be getting our own way. And that's a tough place to be. That's a tough place to be when God is saying, stick in, even though, God, you don't seem to be answering my prayers. God, even though you don't seem to be doing what I want you to do, and yet God is calling us to stick in and to keep on going. So this morning, we want to be thinking about the third member of the Trinity. Now, if you grew up in a church like I grew up in, which is a great church, but probably the only time Holy Spirit was mentioned was, and it was back in the day, it was the Holy Ghost was just at the blessing at the end or maybe in a prayer. And every time I heard Holy Ghost, I was like, oh, what's the Holy Ghost? Oh. Holy Spirit is, is you know, it, it's a different word, but it doesn't, for some folks, it still fills us with a little bit of fear a little bit of nervousness. We, we get a bit worried about what He might do if we let Him loose in our lives. One minister once said, the Holy Spirit is like an elderly relative that we keep in a back room, that we only let them out if we think they're going to behave, and it's a safe place to let them out in. This is, I think, true of how we treat Holy Spirit. We're not sure we fully trust what Holy Spirit is going to do, and also because of people through the past who have misused His name. I've always been challenged, and, and every time I hear this quote, I am challenged by A.W. Tozer's challenge to the church when he said that if the Holy Spirit left the building, if the Holy Spirit left the church today, 95% of what we do would carry on as usual. And then he goes on to say, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the early church, 95 percent of what they do would have stopped, and everyone would have known the distance. There is an urgent need today to acknowledge and to honor the Holy Spirit, and to realize that just like Jesus, we need to be filled with Him daily, because without Him, we are not effective. He is a person to encounter. He's not some ghost that we run away from. He's the Holy Spirit who we invite in and let Him fill us up with the love and the knowledge of God our Father. He's real, He's here, and He's essential. He's essential to everyone who wants to live their lives for Jesus. By living a Spirit-filled life, we're following Jesus' example. The reason that I'm all about the Holy Spirit is because Jesus was all about the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus was completely filled with the Holy Spirit from His conception, from His actual part of coming to the earth, the Holy Spirit was there. To His baptism, the dove fell. It says that the heavens were ripped open and the Holy Spirit fell upon Him when He was baptized. Throughout His ministry, through His death and through His resurrection, the Holy Spirit is there. And so, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, how much more do you and I need the Holy Spirit? Isn't that true? You know, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, Jings, I need so much more. And the truth is, you probably do as well, because you can't do it on your own. When we look at the beginning of the Gospels, we see from the beginning, Jesus was filled with the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is involved throughout His life. I that's why I get so excited with Alpha and the Holy Spirit Day, because when we've got guests who come, and you may have been a guest who've done the Alpha course, and you're going through the course, and things are going well, you're getting a nice feed, and it's, it's all quite exciting. But then on Holy Spirit Day, it's when it becomes real. It's when the rubber hits the road, and actually you discover that God not only cares about you, but He loves you, and He specifically loves you and is interested in your life and in how you live it and how you can live it for Him. Holy Spirit was involved in Jesus' life, and Jesus wanted the same for His disciples. When we read Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 8, it says these words, on one occasion while He was eating with them, this was after the resurrection, He gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They then gathered around him and said, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? The disciples still hadn't got it. He said, it's not for you to know the times or dates. The Father is set by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus was all about getting the Holy Spirit into His followers, and He still has the same desire today, that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we will be effective for Him in His kingdom. So, what happens when Holy Spirit comes? Well, let's read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. We were so close. Pentecost is next Sunday. We almost got everything tied in together. One week out, it's not too bad. But here we read what happens at Pentecost. So, as you think of Pentecost this week and as we celebrate next Sunday, this is the passage that really changes everything. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? In other words, uneducated oafs. Then how is it each of them, hear, each of us hears them in our native language? Parthenians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? mean. The people are praying. When you look at this passage, you see that the people are praying, and they're waiting in expectancy. 
They have no idea what was coming, but they trusted God. They trusted Jesus for good gifts. They were all together in one place. Now, elsewhere we discover that Jesus spoke with 500 people, met with 500 people. But the church at this point seems to be about 120 people. So they were at 500, but maybe due to impatience or fear, it had dropped to about 120 folks. That often happens, doesn't it? The church is expecting it's ready to go, it's got a good crowd going, and then all of a sudden things don't happen the way that it's meant to happen in their heads, and the church shrinks down. 120. 120 people. And it changes the world. It changes the world. And I think most Sundays here, we get at least 120 people here. We, when we're filled, can change the world. The unity here, however, is remarkable. Before Jesus' death, they were all over the place. They were denying, they were running away, they were arguing with each other, they were moaning about who was going to be the greatest, who was going to have all authority. And yet, when Jesus' death and resurrection comes, their unity is remarkable. Peter is forgiven, he's set free. He is on the case because Jesus was on his case. They kept together in worship and in prayer. This is the key. They were regular in their prayer and their worship. They met together, and they kept their eyes on Jesus. And if you get nothing else out of this this morning, folks, worship and prayer, keeping your eyes on Jesus, this is the key. And then the suddenly moment arrived. There's that word in this passage. Suddenly the Spirit arrives. And throughout Scripture, there's amazing episodes where suddenly God moves and things change. And these suddenly moments still happen today. These suddenly moments still happen today. God still moves today, folks. When we have our joint worship events with other churches, suddenly the Spirit comes. When we have our Alpha Days here, suddenly the Spirit falls. I've been in meetings, I've been in small prayer meetings where suddenly the Spirit falls and things just go to the next level. It comes when we worship and when we pray. And we need to be ready for these suddenly moments. And suddenly moments are often not what we expect. God had never moved by breathing tongues of fire upon people before, and yet this is what happened. Folks, <laughs> church has become so predictable, isn't it? If you come to this church on a Sunday morning, you know what's going to happen? How have we allowed church to become so predictable? How have we allowed church to become so beige, so bland? Why have we allowed church to be that way? Because we want comfort, don't we? We want, we want things to be just so, so that we don't get confused. And yet, every Sunday, every day, we come to worship the God who's made it all, the creator of the universe, the one who angels have to hide their faces when they see Him because He is so amazing. We try to box Him into an hour or so on a Sunday, and woe betide if we go past 12 o'clock on a Sunday. Oh, jings, you never hear the end of it. We need suddenly moments, folks. We need that suddenly moments to take over, to let God work and not care what other folk think. Can I get an amen? <laughs> oh, you're going, no chance. I'm not in this or that. We want Holy Spirit to come in. We want those suddenly moments. Lord, may you come in and show us what we need. God fills the house with Himself. God fills His house with Himself. God begins here in the church. This is where revival is birthed, in the hearts of you and me, in your heart, in my heart. If it doesn't start there, then we are not the church, if I would be so bold. It begins in the hearts of His people. Remember Isaiah's vision of the robe overflowing in the temple and flowing out of the temple? 
It's similar to how the church, how the Spirit fills the church. Read verse 2 again. Suddenly, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting, and it flowed outside of the house. Revival begins in the house of God, in the hearts of God's people, but it doesn't stop there. The disciples experience something they've never had before, strong wind, tongues of fire. In revival, God seems to do things that He's never done before, and you and I need to be ready. There seem to be tongues of fire. They didn't know what was happening, but they trusted. They couldn't explain it, but they trusted. And not all of what God does can be explained. It was a personal and it was also a corporate experience. It was something that happened within them that flowed out. And that's what we need today. When we invite Holy Spirit to come, we've got it, we've got it on a banner right before us every Sunday. When we invite the Holy Spirit to come, we need to be ready for what He wants to do. Jesus baptized, yes, in the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This gift came from Jesus, and it still does. Everyone who seeks Him to be filled will be filled. Luke 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 13 says that God has only got good gifts for His children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Like the early disciples, including Paul, when we get the Holy Spirit, when we get the Holy Spirit is when we put our trust in Jesus. In Ephesians, Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that phrase, that verb, be filled, is actually a present continuous verb. What does that mean? Well, when he says be filled, it means keep on being filled. Don't ever stop. A. W. Moody, I can't remember his initials, but D.L. Moody, that was it. D.L. Moody says, why do I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because I leak. Because I leak. And that's so true for us all. C.H. Spurgeon said, too many Christians have come through Calvary, but not Pentecost. And as a result, we live like butterflies when we're called to be eagles. And the Old Testament priests were anointed with blood and oil, and so do we. We need the blood of Jesus and the oil and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But as we get the Holy Spirit, it's not just for our own entertainment. It's not only so that we feel better. We don't get the Holy Spirit in just so we can feel better about ourselves. Holy Spirit comes in to equip us to be evangelists. That's what Pentecost is. The people got the power to go and share the good news with the people in different places. The disciples needed the Holy Spirit to be witnesses to Jesus in different languages, and it's the same for us as church today, to share the gospel in a language that the world around us understands. And that might be given tongues of different languages but it might just be that church is meant to speak in a language that people outside of the church will hear and listen. Too often throughout the ages, church has all been about judgment and about how you're doing things wrong. Maybe the language we need to speak today is about love and compassion and kindness. You know, if you want to take a model, take the fruits of the Spirit that Anne shared with us this morning. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, goodness. These things might just be the language that your neighbor needs to hear. These things might just be the language that those you meet at work need to hear. The gift of tongues communi communicate effectively what the people need to hear. Holy Spirit will give us the ability to do that. We live this way. When we live this way, more and more people will discover and come to Jesus. At Pentecost, 
God's perfect timing came in once again. The perfect timing meant that there was an international community worshiping together, and what they heard was the good news of Jesus in their own language. There was bewilderment, then there was amazement, and then the church was truly born. I'm not a mountain climber. I have no desire ever to climb a mountain. There might be some folks here who have got that crazy bug. But I once heard someone say the reason that mountain climbers tie each other together is to keep the sane ones from going home. Whoever said this was obviously playing with us a wee bit, but we know that mountain climbers are tied together to keep from getting lost or going off a cliff. But there is another piece of truth there. When things get tough up on the mountain, when fear sets in, many a climber, I guess, is tempted to say, this is crazy, I'm going home. And I think as disciples of Jesus, we sometimes have days like that. So I think Jesus told the disciples, and He tells us today, to stay tied together, like the climbers tied to each other. We are tied together by the Spirit, to trust in the One who's always more than what we can understand, to keep us moving ahead on this journey of faith, to let us know that He will never leave us or forsake us. Because when we're tied together, when the Holy Spirit comes, we're invited to go to the ends of the earth. The, the gift of the Holy Spirit was not just so people would feel good. The gift of the Holy Spirit was given to spread the gospel. God's timing was perfect. God's timing meant that the gospel would be shared from city to town to village to home to home to the ends of the earth, to reach those who need to hear in a language they understand that Jesus died for them. Some folks have given up on the church, but God has not given up on the church. The church is still plan A. All that is needed, God is giving to His church. God loves the church. It's the bride of Christ. Jesus loves His bride, and He's coming for His bride someday. But until that day, we are to remember that Holy Spirit is with us, that He is sent to empower us. He is sent to bring us life and to bring life to others. Jesus has great plans for us. And as Jesus loves the church, we need to play our part as servants of His, so that His kingdom can come, so His glory is revealed, so that many more will put their faith in Him. So I wonder if we would just take some time now to invite Holy Spirit in, to have that suddenly moment, to focus on that banner that says, Come, Holy Spirit, come. So let's just take some time and invite him in. Holy Spirit, come. If you want to, you can put your hands out as a sign that you want to receive. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and fill each one of us, even when we're nervous, even when we're fearful, not knowing what you will do. Holy Spirit, come. Fill us to overflowing so that as we're filled up, we will go out to share the good news. 
May you bring revival in this house, not for ourselves, but so that we can serve in the overflow of your Spirit in the town of Dalkeith and in the nation of Scotland. Lord, may your kingdom come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Michael's going to come and pray for us.